our God, you are holy forever. And how grateful we are that you are who you are. We praise you. Now we invite you to move among us and within us. We open our hearts and minds to you. Would you speak, Jesus? In your name, amen. These are the words that Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, said when he was asked to renounce his God and to worship the Roman God that was before him. 86 years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? This bishop of Smyrna had a letter written about him describing the martyrdom that took place around 160 AD, written by eyewitnesses who shared with the church what Polycarp went through. You see, the city of Smyrna was devoted to their Roman worship, and Christians were persecuted for not worshiping and participating in what they were doing. This letter shares details about Polycarp's death. This is the, this is the earliest record of martyrdom outside of the New Testament record. Polycarp was likely the last person who knew one of the disciples who walked with Jesus, being that he was a disciple of John. Here he is, an elderly man being burned for his faith. And I quote directly from this letter. It says, all the martyrdoms which God allowed to happen, who could not admire their honor, their patience, their love for the Lord? They were whipped to shreds till their veins and arteries were exposed and still endured patiently, while even those who stood by cried for them. They had such courage. The Lord then stood by them and talked with them. In this very record, this eyewitness account, it describes from those who lived in Smyrna that whips and fire and animals were all used to torture believers in that day. One of the things that causes people to question this letter is how closely it parallels the suffering of Jesus, as well as the miraculous signs when they tried to kill the bishop but couldn't, though he did go to his death. Here's what we know. Many believers died for their faith. The persecution was intense. And this is true now as true as it was then. That the story of the suffering Christ has been what has strengthened believers through all time. The Christ who comes and who suffers and who goes through it and who makes it to the other side. Who suffers and dies and rises again. This is is our Lord, our Jesus. As I hear the stories of the martyrs who died for their faith, I ask myself, what gave these men and women the courage to stand firm in their belief? In the face of death, they stood. And that begs the next question, am I cultivating a life now that would respond in the same way? How do I face suffering and stay true to God and conviction? There's, if you look at the map that we saw last week, about 30 miles north of Ephesus is the city of Smyrna. And both cities are on the Aegean coast in modern Turkey. Smyrna is modern day Izmir, now the third largest city in the country of Turkey. Then it probably had just over 100,000 people populating its city, but now the population center is huge. And as we were there with the Seven Churches tour, they, the believers, the Seventh-day Adventist Christians who are there now experience persecution, not to the same degree, but they still have to have some parts of their faith that are underground. Let's hear the words of Jesus Christ to this church, these words in red where Jesus speaks to the people living in that place. If you could just go to the next picture, the ruins of, of Smyrna for a moment. If you can imagine this scene in this city being the context for where we're going today. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, 
These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days, but be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you the victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Those who are victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Now, if you remember, last week we talked about four elements that are in nearly every one of these letters to the seven churches. There is a characteristic of Jesus Christ that meets the needs that that particular church has. There's an affirmation to that church. There is a rebuke and there's a promise that Jesus says, if you go all the way through it, then on the other side there's this. So these four elements are in nearly every letter with a few exceptions. And here we find the very first words that Jesus says to these people who are suffering, these people who are facing, like what Polycarp did in dying, being martyred for his faith. They're watching the believers in Smyrna die for their faith. What are his words? What is his characteristic that he draws on? It's the suffering Jesus. I'm the first and the last. I'm the one who died and who rose again. I'm the one who knows what you're going through but made it all the way through to the other side. Look at Jesus. Right from the beginning, his words, his message to them, I understand. I know. I know your affliction, Jesus says to them. We don't serve a God who is immune to pain. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted, or another translation, tried in every way just as we are and yet did not sin. The theme of this entire letter is trial and persecution and tribulation. And the very first thing Jesus says to them, I understand. I get it. I'm not unfamiliar with your suffering. Now, when we think of persecution in the Western world, we think of some you might have known personally who have been fired from their jobs for refusing to work on the Sabbath, or some who have been mocked by their families for their belief in God, like curse God and die. These friends that come along and say, why do you still believe after all that's happened to you? We might know some who have in their schools experienced mockery from those who don't believe. In this sense, everyone has gone through some kind of trouble, but even more broadly, every one of us suffers. Every one of us has faced some kind of pain. The church in Smyrna was facing a particular kind of pain. In the literal sense, this Greek word for tribulation means to crush or to apply pressure. I want you to see a video of what would have immediately come to their mind as they heard this Greek word that was just shared by Jesus with them. We are entering the rainy Hello, my name is Majd and I'm one of the guides at Nazareth Village. We are standing in our fully functioning replica of a first century olive press. We are entering the rainy season at the moment, uh, November and December, and this is the olive season, so our villagers already started harvesting the olives off of the trees and we bring them in here in order to press them. Uh, Of course, olives are hard. You cannot just press them right away. Uh, The first thing you do in the process is crushing them. And that's why we use this big stone over here. Uh, Mosey, the donkey, is helping us move the stone around. And this stone will crush the olives and the pits. Everything needs to be crushed so finely until it turns into paste. And then it's ready for the next uh, stage of pressing. So they would have thought of this word, crushed, 
with this picture. So with olives crushing until a paste, with grapes crushing until the fruit was so pulverized that the juice ran out. That's the affliction that they were undergoing. This is the kind of hardship. Have you ever felt crushed? Have you ever felt like life is crushing you down? This is what these believers were experiencing. Actually, brutal opposition, the physical torture, the painful death. Each year they were required to come in the Roman Empire and to declare Caesar is Lord. And because the Christians in Smyrna refused to participate in this act, they were brutally opposed. We see also that in this letter, their persecution was not just limited to the physical side. They also, in this letter to Smyrna, it indicates that they were a very poor church. Again, this word in Greek needs to be clarified because there are two different Greek words used for poor. One means needy. It's to describe those who are just barely getting by. But the other word, the word used here to describe Smyrna, it is the worst possible state of poverty. It's those who have been stripped through the course of their persecution of having anything. You see, history tells us that under the rules of the Caesars, the, those labeled as Christians were ostracized. They weren't able to participate in buying or selling. So that meant that they were suffering without the physical needs. They were a poor church being fiercely attacked on all sides. Do you understand a bit more what this imagery of the persecuted people that Jesus is speaking to. To them he says, do not be afraid. Like the psalmist in Psalm 56, 3, that when I am afraid I trust in you, these believers continue to draw back to draw on hope in God in the midst of their pain. Now, as if crushing, the physical crushing act was not enough, and as if the financial blows were not enough, there is a third part told in verse 9, the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and yet are not. There were those in Smyrna who professed to be faithful to the true God, those who even professed perhaps to be followers of Christ, who associated with the church, attended the meetings, said all the right words, they knew all the right answers, but, it says, while they professed to be followers of God, they were actually agents of Satan. It says they were members of the synagogue of Satan. Friends, the greatest threat to the church is those who are in it. You see, those whose names are on the book and attend church regularly, who hold church leadership, but who are actually working as agents of the enemy. I believe these people were heartbroken most, not by the physical suffering, not even by the financial loss and the poverty, but by those who were betraying them from the inside. Like the psalmist, you can hear their pain in Psalm 55. The psalmist says, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among the worshipers. It's someone right within us. It's someone I knew. It's someone who betrayed me from the inside they said. So I've heard this over the years. People who have said, that's, that's why I have a hard time with the church. I expect people to be this way in the world, but it's harder when they are like this way in the church. So the church in Smyrna is being crushed by persecution, torn down by poverty, disheartened by those who are in the faith, but really aren't being used by God, but by the enemy instead. To these ones, Jesus says, you feel poor, but you're really rich. You feel beaten down, but you're really victorious. You see, he sees them totally different than they see themselves. Which reminds me of a conversation I had in this last week that said resilience doesn't often feel that way. You look at your life, you think there's no way people could see me as resilient, but everyone else looking in on you is moved and inspired by how you keep pressing on. It doesn't often feel good in the moment, but Jesus sees them differently than they see themselves. He says, you're rich, you're victorious. 
And then he drops this as if they should know exactly what this means, but I just know that they felt this deep within their heart because they're watching. If you could imagine watching your friend die, watching someone die for your faith, and he says, remember, the second death has no power over you. He just just reminds them of eternity right in that moment, reminds them of what's coming and what they have before them. He says, you are rich, you are victorious. Be faithful even to the point of death because even if they take their, your life from you, your future is secure. The second death has no power over you. You will gain a victor's crown. We see how Jesus sees those who are suffering. Can you relate to this? Maybe you aren't exactly in this situation that they are in, but many of us feel crushed. Caregivers, educators, volunteers, you show up when it's hard, you sacrifice for real, and in a society that values self-care, and we even have a phrase, not playing the martyr, right? We have to ask ourselves, is the suffering that we're experiencing something that Christ calls us to? Is this something that Christ is walking us through? It doesn't mean Christ causes the suffering, but every good thing costs someone something. So they were called to be faithful even to the point of death. And you can't get around that they were joining in the suffering of Jesus with someone who understood what they were going through. Current day suffering doesn't always lead to death, but it often leads to a death of belief, which is why it's so stunning when it's the opposite. I was standing in a conversation to this last week that moved me. And if you know these two individuals, you are blessed. If you know Dalton Mastercola and Bob Ferguson, you are blessed. And as I stood there, I was moved because You see, what it looks like to be a modern-day martyr doesn't always look like losing your life, but allowing God to hold on to you and holding on to God, even when everything appears to work against that faith and that trust. So Dalton was describing standing at the bed of his son, at the foot of the bed, saying, God, I want you to heal my son. I want him to open his eyes. I just want him to raise up. I want him to come with me now. But I will love you even if you don't heal him. I will love you. You as a church keep praying for Felipe. We're still praying for that miracle. We want it and his parents want it. We all are praying for this. But to have the faith to stand there and to say I will love you no matter what. Even if you don't. And Dalton turned to his friend Bob and he said, this man is so special to me because I watched him go through losing his son and staying faithful to Jesus. And that Bob and Ethel show us what it looks like to lose a son and to to keep holding hope. And you don't know how many times he said to him that I've thought of you through this experience. And we had this moment of crying together because... Nothing is wasted with God. It was a powerful witness to me and to all of us that when you hold on even to the point of death, even when you hold on beyond the point of being crushed to where everyone is wondering how can you keep holding on, what it bears witness to is the first and the last the one who died and who rose again and the one who is coming again because the crucified and risen and soon coming savior is within you, giving you that strength. That couldn't come from yourself. And so though Bob would never choose to go through that suffering and though Dalton would never choose to go through that suffering, they are suffering alongside Christ who sustains them. Dalton shared this quote with us from Ellen White that continues to bring courage. When any Christ follower through sorrows and suffering prays God, the devil is defeated with the same power that Jesus had when he defeated him at Calvary. The same power that defeated the enemy then 
defeats the enemy now in your life and in their lives. It's a powerful witness. It's a stunning witness that nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, not anything the enemy tries. These believers in Smyrna felt crushed and poor and persecuted and in pain. And though you likely aren't going to face what they faced exactly, though there are believers in the world today who are suffering in that same way, in that same way giving their life, you too go through suffering and how you go through that suffering is a witness. Notice this that this is one of those exceptions I talked about. You know, the character of Christ, the affirmation, the rebuke, and the promise to these people that are suffering the worst, to Smyrna, the suffering church, there is no rebuke. God doesn't kick you while you're down. When you are going through it, Jesus just says, I'm with you. Remember, I'm with you. There is no rebuke for this the church. There is just hold on, hold on. We can be certain that we will face persecution. We can be certain that we will go through suffering. And we can be certain of the complete victory because of Jesus. The God who we serve has promised never to leave us lacking, always to supply our need. We have victory because we can be sure that Christ is with us. We're not invincible, but the Bible says that God will go with us through it. The most frequent promises in the Bible is I will be with you. Think about it, the tabernacle, the covenant, the manna, the pillar of fire, the cloud by day, all of it was saying I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. God keeps repeating it in so many ways. We can have the victory because we know that evil is only allowed for a short time and that God will deliver us from whatever presses us, whatever crushes us. Three promises from scripture to hold on to. Psalm 37, 25 says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Philippians 4, 19 says, and my God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory found in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful and will not let us be tempted or tried or tested, same word, beyond what we can bear. But when we are tested, we'll provide a way out so we can stand up under it. Our Lord told these persecuted Christians, be faithful unto death and you will receive a crown of life for the second death has no power over you. Will you be asked to go to the stake like Polycarp? Will you be burned for your faith? I don't know. What I do know is that how you go through suffering, it affects all of us. It bears witness to our Jesus. Our Jesus who says to you and to me, I know your afflictions. Hear this today, Jesus knows. Facing all that we face, he was victorious. He knows what we go through. And our God says, I see you as rich. I see you as victorious. I see you into the future with that crown of life in all eternity. Here's a helpful prayer that I believe these believers in Smyrna were receiving from these words of Christ as it blends this exact thing where Jesus told them to hang on. He invited them to surrender. He invited them to picture something beyond. Reinhold Niebuhr said this in 1926. It was added to later. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. They couldn't change the Roman Empire or the suffering that they were going through. Courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace. Taking as he, Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen.
Thanks so much for watching. We're glad to have you here and a part of this community, and we pray for you regularly. To support this ministry, we would love to have you subscribe and click on the bell so you'll be notified every time we post new content. Another way to support is to go to our website, azurehills.org, and click on Give so that your donation can make a difference in furthering this message and this ministry. We appreciate you so much.